I, I'm, I'm going to throw a bomb in this, uh, in this discussion. Uh, because I would actually disagree with Hydroon that we cannot reach fishermen. Oh, yes. we, we can. It's just a matter of looking at looking at the fishermen, looking at how they think, and trying to use that for for your advantage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about perceptions and I'll talk a little bit about uh, about education. So by now, this is who we are, we throw C, and by now everybody knows we do education of marine professionals. Um, including fishermen. So we've been working with fishermen in education for about 15 years. Obviously, when the, your who is fishermen, you, you need to know something about the target group. You need to know how they think. And we have a clear message. We want them to be more sustainable, more ocean literate, more aware. But to do that, you need to look at the target group. You need to know something about them. So I'm going to be doing two things. Uh, first, a few scientific uh, data, some research that my colleague Marika has done in the past, um, and then I'm going to have four concrete examples for my courses where you see that that is a challenge, but a fun challenge. Um, it's by no means comprehensive, it's just meant to put some examples in and some inspiration on how you can, how knowing something about your target group is essential. Okay, that's Marika, a lot of people in this room know her. She participated in this project, and in 2009, before she came to ProSea, she did a research on perception on change and status of North Sea fish stocks. So looking at not so much the stocks itself, but at people, how they think. So she interviewed fishermen, policy makers, NGOs, environmental NGOs, and scientists about fish stock assessment, about this figure. How is the fish stock going into the North Sea? And she published first in marine policy, so scientific data, scientific articles, and I have those for people that are interested, but she also published in Fishing News. So she translated her results to fishermen, two big articles in Fishing News, explaining that we, we just don't think the same way. Um, and a very quick, I have one sheet about her results, which doesn't do the research, research justice, but one thing that always strikes me, that Fishermen think differently, <coughs> think differently than NGOs, and think differently than policymakers. Basically, in two ways, spatially in time or in space, but also in time. So first, I'll, I'll look at space. If I look at policymakers, people doing the quota, they think North Sea because the quota are for a fish stock in an ocean. Um, so they look at the North Sea as the area that they talk about. Scientists do that too. They talk about the ocean, but the part of the ocean where the fish stock is, and they talk about that as a stock, and that's why we have quota. Fishermen don't. When fishermen talk about their about fish stock, they talk about the area that they fish. They are the ones fishing in a certain area, and they know everything about that little spot, and sometimes a bigger spot. So we're talking about different discussions. It's not that one of them is wrong, they talk about different things. Um, NGOs often talk about global, talk about the seas are overfished. They don't talk about the Mediterranean or they talk about the North Sea, they talk about the world seas. So we have different spatial levels that we talk about. Second thing is we talk about differences in time. I mean a policymaker has the responsibility to make the quota for the next year, to set the quota for the next year. So they look at the years before, they look at the year after, and they go like, okay, so this is how we do it. Scientists look a little bit wider, because they have to base everything on scientific data. Again, fishermen don't. Fishermen look at the time that they have fished on their particular spot. So all the fishermen would be looking at long term. They know on their specific spot how it changed over the time that they fished. Some fishermen have been fishing 10 years. So they talk about 10 years. So NGOs always talk about long term. When it was way back when we, we caught caught in the North Sea that were this big. They talk sometimes 100 years back. So if you have an environmental NGO talking to a fisherman, the environmental NGO would be talking about global scale, long term, and a fisherman is talking about his area, often short term. And it makes total sense that we have a different discussion. 
and if you want to talk about that, it's important to, to keep that in mind. So it's the first example. Second one is a little bit more um, recent. I don't know if everybody's familiar with the discard ban or the landing obligation. Yes, no, maybe. I'll explain it shortly. Fishermen, when they catch fish, they, they catch fish that they cannot take to shore or that, that are commercially not interesting. So normally, in the past, they would throw those overboard. And it's called discarding. So discarding is basically the fact that you catch a lot of different fish, some are interesting, and the rest you toss overboard. Um, in the reform of the common fisheries policy, the EU has decided to gradually eliminate discarding over a period of like five years, and it's called the landing obligation. So slowly, fishermen will have to take everything to land, including the ones that are too small. So, if you look at the rationale behind it, if you look at policymakers, they say discards, when they throw them overboard, most of them do not survive. So, due to uh, social societal pressures, we have a discard ban, which means that we force fishermen to fish differently, to fish more selective, which means we have less discards, which means we have lower mortality, which means we have a lower pressure pressure, fishing pressure. So at the end, we have an improved fish stock, we have a, it's good for the ecosystem, and we have more profit. That's the rationale behind the discard ban, looking at a policy perspective. Basically, a moral decision, because people do not want to discard, society doesn't want that particular thing, and we justify it in an ecological way. But supposedly the discard ban would be good for everybody, for the fishermen, for the ocean, and for the fish stocks. Fishermen think entirely differently. Because fishermen assume that if you discard, many fish will survive. Always discussion, it's very interesting. And if they don't survive, they're food for the rest of the system. So they're an essential part of our ecosystem. We will not have any gulls flying anymore because uh, if we don't discard anymore. So there's different assumptions. So what they say, if we have a discard ban, and we will of course go the same way as we are, business as usual, because selective fishing is not possible, um, then two things will happen. One is there's going to be less food in the ecosystem because we take the discards out, which means a lot more species die because you take them to land and they die, which is bad for the ecosystem. In addition to that, um, the undersized fish die, so there's a higher fish pressure, fishing pressure because we take them out of the ocean. There's more waste, so and there's less profit for us as fishermen. Same regulatory, the regulatory thing, different conclusions. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not so strange. They think of their own in their own way, and we get to a different conclusion. So recently, we've been there's a lot of research now because one of the key terms is how many discards survive. Um, recently, and this, this is March 16, a research has been published that if you look at the two main flatfish in the Netherlands, it is proven now, or the first results of the survival rate research are that place survives, 15% of the place survives, and 30% of salt survives. Um, and then there's an article from the Scientific Institute, low survival rates among discarded flatfish. Can anybody guess what fishermen will say? Those are high rates? Well, yes. They would say, yes, but if we take them to land, 0% survive. <laughs> so we look at a different perception of the problem. And people, of course, look at it in their own way. And in a sense, they're both right. It just depends on how you look at it. So that's the research. Um, what I'm going to do now is name four uh, concrete examples. We've been doing courses for like 15 years now. And we, we see some of Do I have time for that? Four examples? Seven oh, eight. Um, Two minutes each. I can slow down. Um, <laughs> four examples uh, in our courses where I think you can see that perceptions are an important thing to take into account if you, if you educate a fisherman. First one is ecology. Um, in all our courses, we start with the ocean. We start with talking about how the sea works. Because we think if you want to become ocean literate, you want to care 
you need to know about the ocean. So we talk about plankton and we talk about food chains and the whole, the whole shebang. And when possible, we actually take the fishermen out onto tidal flats or ocean and actually let them feel the, the, the bottom of the sea and let them get some more feel about uh, the oceans itself. Um, regularly, regularly uh, I hear that fishermen are really surprised that you need plankton to get fish. Blind bottom, not for me. Um, they just, one way or another, they've never been taught that. And so you can talk about fish stock assessments, you can talk about survival rates and everything. If you don't know this, I mean, you can't have the same discussion. So it's very important to start that basic. Second example, even more mind boggling. Um, part of our courses is also, we do sustainability, so part of that is also money. So we talk about uh, fishing economy. How do you make money with fishing? So you fish, you go to the auction, you get money and you have cost. So at the end of the story, you have money to spend. So we actually go through how do you make money at an auction and what kind of cost do you have and at the end, how, how do you earn your money? Um, especially, I mean, it gets a little bit better, but it, it's still the case. Um, 15 years ago, the first time I did these courses, I was really surprised about this. In the Netherlands, this is a Dutch story. Um, fishermen are convinced in their community that you are the best fisherman if you catch the most fish. Um, so we talk about costs and we talk about uh, saving costs or more income or quality or MSC that you might make a little bit more money. All very true. But if you are really jealous of the other fisherman next door, if he, may, if he catches more fish, then that is something you really need to tackle. And really, they have, they'd rather go to sea, have a lot of cost and catch a lot of fish, than have less cost but don't catch as much fish. Either. They really don't look at the end of the story. It gets a little better, especially when the ore prices went up, they, they started thinking about this more. But this is mind boggling. And, and we can talk about certification schemes and all that kind of stuff, but this is essential. You need to talk about this as well, at least. Third one. Um, this is from a, the, the first two are mainly from a, a fishing academy uh, courses. This is an example from a course that we did for a mixed group of fishermen and traders, so the fish supply chain. And we talked about one of the big supermarket chains in the Netherlands, Albert Heijn. Uh, and we invited the guy who does fish, who does the, 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 inco, um, the, the retail of the fish at Albert Heijn, to come and talk to this group about the policy of Albert Heijn. And Albert Heijn had decided at that point to go more sustainable, and since a lot of the Dutch fishery did not have MSC or not sustainable fish, he did not have the Dutch fisherman's fish in his store. Uh, so the guy started talking, um, and he was basically, it was quite embarrassing really, about 45 minutes they were bashing him every single moment that they had. We actually called him up later and apologized as course leaders because we did not expect that. So like 45 minutes he was talking and they were like, you this and Albert Hand this and why this? And, and then at some point one of the fishermen raised his hand and said, but um, so, 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 so what do we have to do to get our fish into your store. So they spent 45 minutes in being quite um, primary about how they felt about all the time. And then one of them decided, hey, but maybe that doesn't work. Maybe we gotta help, we gotta work together. But we had to go through that first period to get to that stage. Um, and then the fourth one, which is fits with Christina's remark, uh, the biologist. Uh, I regularly have that, you, you go and give a four day course to fishermen. You sit there, wait till they come in, and this is how most of them look with the earrings and all that kind of stuff, big guys. Um, and they come to you and they come in and they say, uh, are you a biologist? And because if you are, we're not gonna believe anything you say. <laughs> and you got four days to go. Um, <laughs> which is a challenge, which is very interesting. I mean, you can get over that, but that's a long story. I won't do that. Um, but it's true that they are not going to believe you because you are a biologist. Um, now, I have a colleague, he's in this room, who is a, um, 
marine resource management. Um, oh, he studied marine resource management. Uh, so he's real. I'm not a biologist, by the way. I'm an environmental scientist, so I get away with being a biologist. Um, he is. Um, the interesting thing in, in Tim's case, he's also a fisherman. Because his grandpa was a captain on one of those big pelagic trawlers. So when he actually says his name, and in Pro C we call it the Haasnoot factor. Haasnoot is a, a common name in one of the fishing villages in the Netherlands. Um, then suddenly they start to listen. Which is very interesting, because he's more biologist than I am. But still, because he's also a fisherman, doors open. Um, which doesn't mean that I, as a biologist, cannot open the doors. It depends on how you do that. But you see that their perceptions are, his fishermen think differently. They're not stupid, they're not uninterested, but they have different information, they have different time frames, they look at things differently. And if you're an educator and you want to educate them, you've got to take that into account. So I have a few uh, uh, lessons learned for us uh, for over the years uh, for effective education. First of all, um, I think we need to respect their knowledge. We talked about that earlier. They have a lot of knowledge. And we also got to respect their opinions. So one of the things we always do, I mean, it's a little bit for behavior in the afternoon as well, it's not enough. You know, I can talk for days about environmental stuff to them, and they go away and think, yeah, okay. Um, what we do is we actually have them share their ideas and opinions. Because what real awareness is, is they have some knowledge that they incorporate in their own knowledge. And that's how they move along. Um, so, but that means that if I want them to respect my knowledge, I've got to respect their knowledge as well. And as an educator, it's a smart thing to do. Um, second one is, make sure your... Second one is, make sure your information is accurate, is relevant, is up to date. So no stories about the seas are being fished empty or stuff like that to, of course, fishermen. Data, information, brought in a way that they can comprehend, of course. But you don't need to make it more dramatic than, than necessary. They, we always say, you guys are the fishermen. Fishing has changed. You need to know this information to be successful as a fisherman. But it's up to you to decide what you do with it. That's not up to me. But this is important information. And it works. Um, the third one, uh, <coughs> open-minded atmosphere. I mean, that's a very short word for a, a big thing in a course. Um, and encourage sharing. One of the things we do in our courses with fishermen, we get in an actor and we com do communication exercises. We try to teach them to be more effective in communication, especially with people with different opinions. I mean, the actor would be the different opinion to start with, and then we just teach them how you can talk, how you, how you can talk to them, because you don't have to fight all the time. You can share information without being insulted or whatever. Fourth one, I think Christina mentioned that as well. Choose an acceptable information channel. Um, and for me, I think uh, the fishing representatives are one thing, uh, but fishermen themselves are the other thing. And by now, I think, as a, as a foundation, we are an acceptable channel as well. So it's not just the top guys, but you can also have people in the field, fishermen that agree with you or that are already moved forward or already have MSC fish or something like that. And the big thing that we always say, stay away from the accusations. Challenge, we want them to be better. We want them to be, su be su sustainable. We want them to improve. But we don't think they're stupid. We understand that it's their decision. So don't accuse them, but challenge them. Which obviously is a fine line, I have to say. But that's also the thing we always say, do stay away from the accusations. That's it. Thank you. So, and if I don't...